Hello, and welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and I am incredibly excited about today's guest, who is an expert in my personal favorite topic, which is mitochondria. So his name is Dr. Martin Picard. He's an assistant professor of behavioral medicine in psychiatry and neurology at Columbia University. He obtained his PhD in mitochondrial biology of aging in 2012. He then moved to the University of Pennsylvania for a postdoctoral fellowship in the Center for Mitochondrial and Epigenomic Medicine with the famed mitochondrial researcher, Doug Wallace. For over a decade, Martin has been studying mitochondria and has worked closely with leading experts in the field of mitochondrial research. In 2015, he joined the faculty at Columbia University where he established the Mitochondrial Signaling Laboratory. He's currently investigating mechanisms of mind-body interactions, specifically regarding novel principles that underlie mitochondrial responses to stressors, the maintenance of human health, and the influence of mitochondrial health on complex cellular and physiological processes, including aging and resistance to disease and stress, uh, resilience, and many, many other aspects of health, uh, including, of course, energy levels. So I am incredibly excited to introduce you all to Dr. Martine Picard, and I think you are going to absolutely love this episode. So that's a, a brief, you know, sort of official bio, but let's simplify a lot of this stuff. So what you do, Dr. Picard, is you, you work in a field called mitochondrial psychobiology. So can you tell everyone exactly what that means? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good question. It's basically the intersection of mitochondria and the, the biological, you know, processes, the things that happens there in the cell inside the inside the organelle, um, and then what happens in the mind, right? So if we simplify this, it's basically mind mitochondria science, kind of like you know mind body, but here we we dive a little deeper uh, than just the body generally, and we specifically focus on mitochondria, uh, in part because mitochondria are the source of energy, right? That's where the reason we breathe and the reason we eat is to fuel the mitochondria, right? The ultimate purpose of breathing and maybe why the breath is, is so common across all ancient traditions and, and you know, religions. The breath is connected to bringing oxygen into the body and then where does oxygen go in the body? It goes in the mitochondria. So, uh, so we study, uh, because mitochondria is so essential to energy, we study how, how the, the mind and the mitochondria interact and, and hopefully it's gonna help us understand better how you know, we humans experience the world and you know, manage to stay healthy most of the time and, and then why we get sick once in a while. Yeah, okay, so I, I wanna back up just a minute. I, I wanna get back to uh, mitochondrial psychobiology in just a minute, but let's, let's back up and just talk about what mitochondria are and kind of the, and, and you can do that very quickly. I know that you know, that topic in and of itself could be three hours long, but just a brief description of what mitochondria are and their, you know, th their, their vision or their, their role in human health has for a long time been conceptualized as you know, sort of just these mindless energy generators in our cells that just pump out energy. They take in glucose and fat and they pump out ATP. And that's kind of what mitochondria are good for. Mm -hmm. And in the last 10 or so years, uh, there's been a really a, like a, a reimagining uh, within the scientific community of the role of mitochondria in human health. So kind of talk to me about your perception of how uh, the, the scientific community's perception of mitochondria has changed over the last couple decades. Mm -hmm. That's a, a really good, um, I think an important transition that is currently happening and uh, you know, a long time ago, about 1.5 billion years ago, uh, something happened that they were, the only thing that existed on the planet were unicellular organisms, right? They were bacteria. There were different kinds of bacteria, uh, little cells that didn't talk to each other uh, very much, probably. Some could use oxygen to make energy, and some others could not use oxygen, and they were fermenting type bacteria like yeast. And then at some point, a bigger kind of cell, bacterium, engulfed a smaller oxygen consuming bacterium and then that smaller oxygen consuming bacterium uh, instead of you know being digested and used for food by the bigger one actually managed to stick around um, and that theory goes became the mitochondria and so and for some reason in evolutionary history that event seemed to have been critical 
to the development of what's called multicellular life, right? Like animals, including like, you know, from as, as small as little worms, flies, you know, mice, dogs, and then humans, thinking, feeling, conscious um, organisms, you know, evolved from, from this, this uh, it's called endosymbiosis, and uh, the symbiosis of things living together and then endo because it's inside uh, of. So the endosymbiotic uh, origin of mitochondria apparently was a, a key evolutionary piece in making complex life possible and then, you know, the complex animals that, that we are. Um, and so from this, their bacterial ancestry and, and origin, mitochondria were discovered you know, about in the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, first observed under the microscope. And people saw that they could move and they could, you know, um, do things and they were named, um, you know, after their actual morphology, they change. Sometimes they can look like small little beans. That's mostly what you see in the textbook. And, and if you Google mitochondria images, uh, the, that's what you see, a bunch of beans <laughs> or, uh, uh, you know, peanut shaped uh, things. And then they have like an outer membrane and inner membrane. And, and inside of that is the mitochondrial DNA, which is actually circular, but like the bacterial DNA. So those are the kind of things that make us let us know that they used to be bacteria and then in the 40s 50s 60s uh, people started to focus heavily on uh, the energy production capacity or function of mitochondria and uh, you know peter mitchell won a nobel prize for understanding how mitochondria could uh, store energy and actually transform energy from food and oxygen into membrane potential how the mitochondria become charged like little batteries uh, and then he figured out that this energy potential, and once, once a mitochondria charge, that energy can be used to make ATP. Uh, and I think most people on your podcast will know about ATP, adenosine triphosphate, as the energy currency of the cell and, and of you know, most living organisms. Um, and then that was the pervading view of mitochondria, their energy powerhouse. And I think most people know about the, the powerhouse of the cell analogy. We actually think it's it's a bad analogy uh, because it's very uh, mechanistic. It's very uh, you know uh, mechanical, I should say. Mm. And mitochondria are so much more than powerhouses, and that's I think in line with the the new transition away from this powerhouse analogy, uh, which portray mitochondria as little machines. Right, the powerhouse it, it it takes an input, transforms it into an output. And then, then that, that's, you know, power generation or transformation. Mitochondria actually have this beautiful complex life where they interact with each other. They can fuse. Uh, so two smaller mitochondria can come together, fuse, become a longer one. So they change shape uh, via their interactions with each other. Then they can undergo the opposite process of fission. So a longer tubular, imagine like a long spaghetti, can, can become fragmented into little beans. So that's called fission, mitochondrial fission. Um, and, and the fused mitochondria or the fragmented or fused mitochondria also have different functions. Uh, so their shape is linked to their function, which is what we see a lot in, in biology. Um, and now our view is you're transitioning from this dynamic view of mitochondria, which you can observe um, you know, through movies and videos, some of which are on, on our website, and you can see, find some of those on the internet now. Uh, and then people are starting to realize actually mitochondria are great, you know, they move, they make energy, but they actually produce signals, you know, they're sensitive to stuff and they, and they generate stuff. Um, so what we're finding is that mitochondria can respond to different hormones or to different metabolic signals. And that's fairly well documented. And then mitochondria release other kind of uh, biochemical signals and maybe other kinds of, you know, vibrational signals or, you know, electromagnetic or something else uh, that can be transmitted between the mitochondria, between mitochondria and other parts of the cell, including the nucleus where the nuclear genome um, kind of rests and waits for signals and information to know which gene to turn on, which genes to turn off through epigenetics. And maybe we'll talk about that. Um, and then ultimately to the rest of the cell, the rest of the body. So mitochondria can send signals, including their own genome. They can release their DNA uh, into the, the cell cytoplasm, the internal part of the cell, or even into the bloodstream. And then those mitochondria derived signals can go everywhere in the body. So now the, the view that we're starting to develop is one of a kind of, of a communicating uh, 
collective of mitochondria distributed across different organs, different cells that uh, talk to each other. Yes, and I want to get into that. I want to get into this kind of mitochondrial DNA leaking into the bloodstream and, uh, and several of the other things you talked about, how mitochondria sense things that are going on in the environment and modulate gene expression. First, I want to ask you to kind of briefly summarize uh, what we now know about the role of mitochondria in human health very broadly and, and you know, just very quick summary. But again, we used to think of mitochondria, as you said, as these just powerhouses of the cell, just kind of taking orders from the DNA, which was the big boss of the cell. And their job is just to burn off carbs and fats and produce energy. Uh, and we now know there's so, so much more than that. Um, but what, what is the role of these mitochondria? Why are mitochondria so important? And what do we now know in the science as far as the links with different diseases and, and aging and so on? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, the uh, medical community and the scientific community uh, have found associations between mitochondrial dysfunction, which is kind of broadly, uh, it means a lot of things, but mitochondria don't functioning well. And if we know mitochondria make energy, but they also move and they also produce other things. And so dysfunction can happen at multiple uh different levels, the same way that human dysfunction, we can be sick in different ways, right? So the mitochondria can be dysfunctional or sick also in different ways. But the medical and the scientific community has linked mitochondrial dysfunction to every disease that I know of. So if you go on PubMed or you know you Google, whatever disease you, you want and mitochondrial dysfunction, there is most likely an article that documents some evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction in, in that disease. <laughs> so uh, what we don't know there. And, and even the aging process itself more broadly. Yes, yes, yes. A aging, the, there's a, a very large body of, of, of scientific evidence linking aging process and mitochondria. And I think quite convincingly showing that uh, mitochondria and dysfunctional mitochondria actually can precipitate or accelerate the aging process. Mm -hmm. And one question, you look at the scientific literature and you Google, you know, whatever disease you're interested in, like Alzheimer's or cardiovascular or cancer and mitochondrial dysfunction, then you find all these papers. You never know if it's the disease that happened through some process that we don't understand that caused mitochondrial defects or dysfunction, or if it's a mitochondrial dysfunction that is a primary cause or driver of the disease, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most studies don't allow us to, to understand this. So... Um, the state of the field is there's a lot of evidence showing mitochondria are not happy. <laughs> mitochondria don't work normally in disease. Now, are they the cause of disease or are they the result of disease? Uh, and that's where, you know, there's a, a smaller body of research that addresses this directionality. And um, a big piece in that uh, effort came in the 1980s, actually, where Doug Wallace and uh, Ian Holt in, in England they almost simultaneously discovered that there were defects in the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so mutations or deletions in the mitochondrial genome uh, that were the cause of human disease. So that was the first time uh, that it was demonstrated that when the mitochondria don't work properly, this can actually cause disease. Yeah. Uh, and since then, there's been hundreds of studies that document these kind of connections. And, uh, you know, every week here in, in the clinic, we see, uh, patients who, who walk in with defects in their mitochondria, and then you see, you see the consequences. Uh, you see the consequences on their ability to exercise, to move, their ability to digest food, their ability to you know, move about, and their ability to think and to process things you know, with cognitive function. So it's very clear now that when the mitochondria don't work properly, they can cause disease and, and they can precipitate a lot of age-related disorders. Right. And one of the other lines of evidence from lots of studies is, you know, interventions that target mitochondrial health, whether it might, it could be something natural, like, you know, let's say polyphenols or EGCG from green tea or something like that, that acts to bolster mitochondrial health in some way, um, or, you know, various other types of hormesis exercise or, or many other types of hormesis that we know have effects on mitochondria, we know also confer uh, various protective effect, uh, effects against various kinds of diseases and have the potential to increase lifespan or at the very least health span. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like you mentioned, exercise. I think exercise is probably uh, the best, um, you know, health promoting intervention. <laughs> uh, 
uh, if it was a drug, it'd be amazing. You know, people would take it all the time. Yeah. Um, there, there's so many good side effects and we don't actually know why exercise is good for you. You know, yeah. there's, there's no mechanistic understanding <laughs> of why exercise is, is so good for, uh, for health span. And, and, uh, it's not quite sure. It makes, uh, it extends longevity. You know, people who exercise a lot don't tend to live, you know, 200 years old. And there's a lot of people who never formally exercise and they don't do, you know, marathon running and all of this. And they end up, you know, living healthy and living very long, but physical activity, you know, being active. Uh, we don't know why that's good. And one theory uh, that we tend to favor is that exercise and physical activity is good for you because it stimulates your mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's hard, to, that's hard to prove empirically. So this is a nice segue. So we know that uh, exercise, physical exercise and movement is very important for mitochondrial health. Um, what, what are some of the other factors that you think are really important in mitochondrial health? And then I want to transition into what your area of focus is, which is the mind and the mitochondrial link. Mm -hmm. So can you, is, are there any other factors before we get to the mind mitochondria? Are there other, any other factors worth mentioning here that are key players in mitochondrial health? Uh, something that's been studied a lot, you know, exercise is, um, we've known for a long time, exercise increases the number of mitochondria in your body. Yeah, so if you go from being a completely, uh, not physically active uh, individual, like, you know, couch potato uh, scenario <laughs> chronically, and then you go and you say, I'm going to run a marathon, and then you start working out a lot you can double the amount of mitochondria in your body, mm -hmm. right? So per, per amount of muscle, per gram of, of, of muscle, you can double the number of mitochondria uh, in your muscle just, just by stimulating uh, the body. And we think that this probably happens also in the brain. The, you, the brain makes more mitochondria and the muscle make more mitochondria if you're more active. So that we've known for a long time. Exercise improves a number of mitochondria also changes uh, how they function. Uh, another thing that's been studied quite a bit is uh, the health benefits of not eating too much. So uh, some people have called this calorie restriction because that's how it was done in animals originally. You would restrict the number of food pellets that you gave animals and then kind of magically animals started to live longer and, <laughs> and, and be healthier. Uh, you know, there are some issues with these studies because the, the, um, the control group the control animals that you know eat as much as they want, they're they're housed always uh, in little cages, right? It's very unnatural to live for a rat or a mouse or you know any animal that we're using these studies to live in such a small shoe size box, and that's how laboratory animals are are, are kept. Shoe size box, no ability to exercise. Uh, most uh, studies don't have a running wheel or any anything else, and then there's an abundance of food as much as you want so in evolutionary history you know these little animals us included we always had to do some movement or some hunting or you know something else to get calories and they're all of the sudden you know in, in evolutionary history that's a very kind of abrupt change where you're you have zero need to do physical activity and then there's as much food as you want so you could argue in all the calorie restriction studies the control group is actually an overfed uh, sedentary <laughs> couch potato situation and then it's not surprising that if you just bring down the number of calories you actually maybe normalize things a bit more right uh, that's interesting i never thought about it that way but it's it's absolutely true especially i assume there were running wheels in the cages not yeah they were not that's not good yeah. yeah. So from those studies, you know, they were called calorie restriction. And then now there've been a lot of human interest in calorie restriction. And there are some studies that are underway, uh, you know, where people try not to eat too much and then they're perpetually hungry for, for life. Um, and apparently I, I actually, I've never done a study on this, but I know some people who have worked with these people and Apparently, these people are not very nice to work with because <laughs> they're a little grumpy. And, you know, feeling hungry is chronically, you know, is not a, a super pleasant thing to, to, to do. And that's why a lot of people cannot stick with this for very long. Yeah. Um, there's more recent uh, interest in intermittent fasting. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, you and your 
audience is familiar with this where you you know you eat normally but then you don't eat for you know a half day or for a full day or for two days there are different models of this but i think the idea here is once in a while feeling hungry is a good thing mm -hmm. uh, and what we know from the animal studies and some human literature is feeling hungry actually recruits and stimulates in the organism a lot of very uh, good adaptive processes so the the, the same way that when you exercise and you stress the body and then you stress the muscle then the muscle responds to this becomes bigger and becomes stronger for the next time it's uh, uh, recruited or it's used and it's, it's stronger and it's adapted so the same kind of thing happens if you feel a little hungry the body feels like oh like now i there's no sugar around i need to start using my mitochondria to use the fats and to use the, the proteins and uh, then it start the mitochondria needed for this are not needed necessarily to burn up sugar. Mm -hmm. So if you feel hungry, typically, you know, there's in the, the blood, uh, the, the blood and the tissue sugars are a little low and then that forces uh, different tissues to adapt by using the mitochondria. So uh, it seems like feeling hungry a little bit, uh, not overeating <laughs> and not perpetually overloading your system with too much of anything, sugar or fat or, or, or proteins, is, is a good thing. And for some reason that stimulates a good um, you know, quality control in the cells like autophagy, mitophagy. So the, the bad stuff gets removed and, and uh, digested away and then new stuff, new mitochondria that are good, well-functioning or synthesized. So mm -hmm. exercise, not eating too much, these are two things that we know are, tend to be good for health and probably at least part of their uh, part of the mechanism or part of the action is through this, through promoting mitochondrial health. Yeah. Uh, so we know one of the third factors now that thanks to your research and the work of some of your colleagues, uh, we know that the mind and a person's psychology can have a profound influence on our, our mitochondrial health as well. Uh, and You've done quite a bit of work. You've you've done some. You've you've published some really amazing research papers that I, I recommend people read. One's called "An Energetic View of Stress: Focus on Mitochondria." Another one's called "Psychological Stress in Mitochondria: A Conceptual Framework," uh, and these are really well worth digging into for anybody listening who's uh, a health professional or just a science geek who's really interested in this topic. Um, so, as you mentioned, mitochondrial psychobiology, this mind mitochondria link. And this kind of gets at the, the whole, you know, Descartes mind-body dualism and the fact that, you know, we now know it's, it's pretty widely accepted, of course, that uh, it's very widely accepted that we know that the mind has a profound influence on the body. There's lots of lines of evidence that we can speak to about how psychological factors influence biological health more broadly and various kinds of diseases. Uh, and we know, for example, childhood trauma can greatly increase risk of, of diseases later on, in leaf, uh, later on in life and many, many other aspects of this. Uh, so we know there's a link there. And yet, despite that, there is this kind of blurriness of what exactly is that communication? How does our mind communicate with our body? What are these channels of communication? And I think your work has, has uncovered uh, a really important aspect of that. So can, can you speak to that? So what is this mind mitochondria link all about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, so that's, that's probably my favorite topic. So, <laughs> so I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, talking with you about this. The, the, uh, I would say exactly, you know, the mind body connection and, you know, just dissociating these as we know is a little artificial right <laughs> we you know as, as humans are really good to break things down into pieces and that's maybe that's a whole point of analysis right to break down into pieces and all of our research methods are, are ways to break things down into into little digestible pieces that we can understand and you know test mechanisms and all of that but really the whole system is an integrated system and uh, as you say, you know, it's, there's well-documented effects, for example, of psychological stress on the immune system. And there were seminal studies done, you know, by uh, uh, the Kegel classers uh, who showed medical students during uh, exam periods, like at the end of the semester, who were super stressed out because um, they think their, their life is going to be done if, <laughs> if they don't pass this exam, then they're more susceptible to infections. So they actually, if you... Um, 
expose them to um, to sort of some stressors. Sheldon Cohen did studies like this where they would sequester people, stress them or not stress them, and then expose them to like a flu uh, virus in the nose, and then showed that. And when people are stressed, their their immune system is down, and they're more vulnerable to getting the cold and uh, and, and to um, uh, to infections. And then the Kiko cluster showed that wound healing, you know, something as fundamental as if there's as a wound on your skin or, you know, on your gum, uh, how quickly that wound heals, uh, which is also an integrated process. You need cells to, you know, kick in for in their proliferation. You need the immune system to come in, produce some cytokines and, you know, the blood flow needs to change and it's a, a whole organized uh, process. And they showed people when you're stressed and if you experimentally stress someone that slows down the wound healing and it makes the person more vulnerable to infections, the immune system is modulated. Uh, so these are some of the, you know, old seminal work uh, that's, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's thought so much in medical school, but it's not part of, of kind of the framework, the general biomedical framework. And what we think one of the reasons is, is because we don't have a really good understanding of the basic uh, molecular or biological mechanisms by which this happens, right? So there's the mind here, you experience something, there's a subjective experience, which is very real, right? Whatever is in your head, <laughs> whatever we experience subjectively, it's very real to the person who's experiencing it. And then there's these biological changes that happen in the immune system, in the, in, the, in the wound, right? Or in the brain. These are very real biological changes. What's connecting these things, right? How do subjective experience uh, get translated in a language that the biology actually follows um, and then responds to? And our guiding hypothesis is that mitochondria and the flow of energy is that connection or that interface. Now, uh, a quick question here. There, there's a lot of people out there who have conceptualized stress, psychological stress, and how it affects the body through different conceptual models. So, for example, you know, one of the most basic ones in, that's been around in the natural medicine community has been the adrenal fatigue model. And it's like stress is bad for you because it taxes the adrenals, which produce this stress hormone called cortisol. And if you do that too much, then it wears the adrenals out. Then you get low cortisol and that's what mediates all these negative effects. Okay. Then it was, you know, as people realized that that model was really way overly simplistic, a lot of people moved towards this HPA axis dysfunction model, which started to realize, Hey, there's a couple players upstream of the adrenals, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And those are really the key players. And so those are the most upstream things as far as what's sensing stress and mediating different effects in their body. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's other people out there, like there's a, a guy out there who specializes in chronic fatigue syndrome, who I've interviewed on this podcast named uh, Ashok Gupta, who really says, no, the, the hypothalamus and pituitary are not the most upstream thing. It's actually the limbic system and the amygdala that are the most upstream thing. And and then we have, you know, for example, there was an article, I believe it was in Scientific American about some of your research with Douglas Wallace, where you guys, and I want to talk about some of the details of the study, but uh, you basically subjected people to stress and then you measured mitochondrial DNA in their blood. Uh, and I believe Douglas Wallace, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but he said something to the effect of mitochondria are probably the most sensitive thing in the body. And so you could maybe make the case in this model that it's actually the mitochondria that are the most upstream thing before any, you know, sort of processing takes place in some of these brain centers. So what, what's your thoughts on how that should be conceptualized as far as what's the most upstream, most sensitive thing that is detecting the first immediate signals of what's going on in the environment? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh... So the work that you refer to was a work that was done in collaboration with uh, Anna Marsland and Brett Kaufman in Pittsburgh, where it shows that psychological stress, if you expose someone to a psychological stress, you ask them to do, you know, to speak in front of a camera and then they feel stress and, and, and they feel a bit angry and <laughs> uncomfortable. We found that 30 minutes later, if you take blood and then you look in serum, there's more mitochondrial DNA that's released. And, uh, so that demonstrates the mitochondria somehow respond to, to that subjective experience and then respond by releasing the mitochondrial genome. And, you know, Doug uh, is, is fantastic and he commented on this study. 
Um, and that's his view, right? That the mitochondria are the most sensitive thing in the body. I tend to agree. And I imagine that it's because, you know, everything in the organism, you know, from just being alive <laughs> requires the flow of energy and anything that is stressful. And by definition, you know, str something that's stressful is something that perturbs us, right? Something that is uh, not stressful and then doesn't elicit anything in the in the organism and it's it's very hard to not be stressed or influenced by anything i think you if you're dead you know if, if there's no flow of energy in the body <laughs> and the, the body is not animated by energy anymore then the body cannot respond to you know to a stressor but we respond to just a little word right? someone says one word and that can trigger a whole kind of cascade the heart starts to beat faster hormones are released blood pressure increases uh, you know, we get warmer and the body actually gets warmer uh, when, when we're stressed. Uh, so there are all of these changes. Every little bit of the stress response uh, from increasing heart rate or blood pressure to producing an, a new uh, hormone or releasing a hormone, every little bit requires energy. So there's, there's nothing in the body that moves or that changes that doesn't require energy. So because energy is so central to every little part of the stress response, all the, you know, from the single gene to the whole person, we think energy is you know, most likely one of the first things to change when there is stress. Um, and then because energy flows mainly in the mitochondria in, in human beings and in you know, complex animals, then mitochondria must be one of the first places to actually perceive, to have the ability to perceive that change in energy flux um, and and then respond to that. So, and there's mitochondria everywhere. You know, the, the three models that you mentioned, the adrenal fatigue, the HP axis, and the limbic amygdala, you know, models. I think these overlap in different ways. And, you know, there's mitochondria everywhere. In, in the amygdala, <laughs> in the hypothalamus and uh, thalamus and the uh, pituitary gland, and the, in, the, in the adrenal glands. And what's remarkable is that, you know, the stress hormones, most people will know about cortisol, which is made in the adrenal glands. Well, where in the adrenal glands is cortisol being made, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually in the mitochondria. Yep. So the, every stress hormone and every also sex hormones, uh, all of these hormones that are derived from uh, cholesterol, they're called steroid hormones, they're all made in the mitochondria. Um, so the, for some evolutionary reason, the body thought it was a good idea to, you know, put the synthesis of one of the most important family of hormones, the sex hormones that define, you know, uh, female from male and the, the stress hormones that allow us to survive uh, different events, you know, throughout life. Those are actually synthesized in, in the organelle that sustains energy. So there's not really a good, um, you know, we can speculate as to why that is, but from our view, I think it's, it's a good illustration of how tightly knit, those things are the stress response and the, the energetic um, capacity of, of the organism. Yeah. I'm curious, are you familiar with Dr. Robert Navio's work on the cell danger response? Yes. I feel like this ties in to your model perfectly. I think you, you're doing these two lines of research that you guys have been doing completely separately. And yet you're basically arriving to a large extent at the same conclusion, which is mitochondria are essentially the most sensitive thing they uh, in the body as far as detecting environmental signals, and then they are determining in, from the model of Dr. Robert Navio, they're determining whether they're going to stay in peacetime metabolism, as he calls it, which is energy mode, where they're actively taking in fuel and producing ATP and powering the organism, or if they're detecting threats, whether they be pathogens, infections, or you know, chemical exposures, or sleep deprivation, or psychological stress, or physical stress and overexercise, or any other number of stressors. Uh, and then they, if they're detecting lots of that input, then they switch out of peacetime metabolism, out of producing energy towards uh, defense mode or cell danger mode, which directs energy and resources of the organism towards defending the organism against the threat. And obviously, the work that I do with people with fatigue and increasing their energy, from this model, the most basic way we define fatigue is from the mitochondrial perspective, too much of your mitochondria have been shifted out of energy mode into cell danger mode. 
Now, he talks about uh, purines, purinergic signaling, and the leakage of like ATP and ADP outside of the cell, and this being a critical signaling molecule that signals other cells in the system about the, the threat present. Mm -hmm. now, in some of your research, you guys have found that mitochondrial DNA actually gets leaked into the bloodstream. And that this, in, in your words, uh, this is a quote from you in, in commenting on some of this research, you said this circulating mitochondrial DNA acts like a hormone. And so it's, 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 it's somewhat mimicking the adrenal glands response to cortisol and it's, uh, and, and it's having all these effects on the rest of the cells where it's communicating, hey, there's a threat present, there's danger, we're under stress, we need to shift more into defense mode. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of similarities, like I said, between your two lines of research. And yet you're, to some extent, talking about different molecules being the key signaling molecules. So can you kind of make sense of all that for me? Yeah, I, I think uh, both models converge. And I, I, I love Bob's, um, you know, we actually met about a year ago at a conference, and it was fantastic to get to chat with him. So I think there's a lot of overlap, and uh, I think we we resonate on, on many uh, different levels. Uh, I think the same way that... If you think about mitochondria, not again as a powerhouse, but as you know, communicating organelles and organisms, uh, you know, other kind of you know living organisms that uh, coexist in the same space, right? That share information, that actually communicate and physically interact, uh, that you know synchronize their function. These are all properties of mitochondria. They're also properties of every other social animals, <laughs> social organisms. So we're starting to see mitochondria as, as, as social organisms. And um, organisms that communicate with each other don't communicate through only one mechanism, right? So there's not one type of thing that, that you do to talk to another person. There's, you know, there are words. They're also nonverbal, right? We all know that whatever expression you have on your face, whatever you do with your hands, with your gestures, that can communicate a lot, right? And or now with these... Classic, the classic wife statement it's not what you said it's how you said it <laughs> the tone yes exactly <laughs> and nowadays we have like phones right and like emails and you can text and you can facetime and you can do like all sorts of things so we have multiple redundant modes of communication and the same way you know neuro if you look at neurons in the brain neurons talk to each other through a variety of mechanisms or electrical gap junction you know related processes where electrical signals can communicate uh, can be uh, um, transmitted, you know, very quickly. And then there's chemical, in neuro mod, uh, neuro, neuro, uh, chemical signals, be, you know, at the synapses and with serotonin and dopamine and some other things. So uh, even, you know, very specific biological systems have multiple redundant ways of, of communication. Uh, and if you take an analogy, uh, the, you know, the mitochondria trying to communicate states of threat or you know states of well-being to the rest of the organism uh, if they only had one switch it's either on or off that might not work really well you know it's like if we only had one word to um to to talk to each other either it's good or it's bad right that, that would not be great we have a vocabulary with thousands of words that we can combine with you know in different sequences and, and so on and, and it's the same thing you know for for computers and you know digital information that's the, the, the flexibility you have when you have multiple signals that you can combine in different ways, you know, the, the texture you can get out of this in an image and, you know, a picture or in a biological system is, is remarkable. So the same way we, we take all sorts of words and, and can communicate some very sophisticated ideas, biological systems have also learned to do this. And that's why there's not only one neurotransmitter in the brain, you know, there's several. And that's why there's, um, I think, multiple different kinds of communication uh, molecules that come from mitochondria. And I think it's to communicate the complexity of, of what's happening at the subcellular level that needs to be communicated um, throughout the organism. Yeah. Now, what it's sort of big picture, what is this signaling all about? So we know that psychological stress, what's going on in the mind affects mitochondria, can cause mitochondrial dysfunction, can cause the contents of mitochondria whether it's the DNA, whether it's purines like ATP and ADP to leak out of the cell into the bloodstream where it's doing some sort of signaling. 
what is this all about? What is, what is this signaling actually trying to accomplish? Like from an evolutionary perspective, why are our bodies designed this way? What good is it actually doing? Mm -hmm. One way to think about it is not as, um, you know, a purely kind of dysfunctional system, like stress is bad, it causes these molecules and then that causes disease, but, uh, you know, not all stress causes disease, right? And, you know, I think many people will relate to stress being actually a pretty stimulating thing, right? And, and if you have zero stress, you know, some people need quite a bit of stress to actually get something done. <laughs> uh, and, you know, with stress can come motivation and, and some other things. There's, uh, you know, Bruce uh, McEwen likes to call it toxic stress when it's, and it's not good anymore. But, you know, all of this stuff before toxic stress can actually stimulate uh you know healing and stimulate adaptation and, and you know uh, uh strength of, of different um, functions um and actually bolster the organism's health and resistance yes disease yes and longevity mm -hmm. yeah and you mentioned hormesis uh, earlier right that's the, that idea there's little stressors will stimulate processes in the body that if those if that stress persists, that can become damaging. But if it's acute, like you go to the gym for an hour or, you know, you walk up the stairs instead of taking the elevator, that will stimulate things in your legs and in your heart and in your brain. And, and then, you know, your body will become a little stronger, uh, you know, as a result. Um, so that's hormesis, uh, the, the body adapting to challenge or, or to stress and then becoming stronger as a result. Um, So I think the, the different processes you were mentioning, um, we see as, as communication, why, you know, why would mitochondria release all of these things? Uh, we think it's the same reason as, you know, why do people talk to each other, right? Because that's how things need to work. You know, why do different organs in the body talk to each other? Why do the different organs are connected with our, a cardiovascular system through blood? Yeah? Information needs to be exchanged. I think it's a basic property of, of life. Um, and, and that's how complex systems, you know, function and, and operate. That's how, um, things, uh, living organisms fight entropy, <laughs> you know, to remain healthy is to go against the, um, you know, the, the forces of physics, you know, if, if, if we were subject to the forces of physics and we didn't have energy flow to, to resist that, then we would just decay, right? We manage to, uh, to go against that and to go against just dissipation of, of matter for, you know, 80, hundred years uh, because of the flow of energy and because, you know, there's communication. So the, um, it's a bit similar if we were to look at the brain from a, a primitive, you know, view, like, I don't know how, how, how long ago, like a, a century ago, and we say, oh, you know, when you, when you stress the brain, through the eye, so that would be like stimulating something from the eye of an animal, let's say. And then, you know, there's all of these chemicals being released uh, in the back part of the brain, the occipital region where the visual information is processed. And there's like GABA and serotonin and like dopamine and these things, you know, would be released. Then you would say, oh, you like, th this must be dysfunctional. But then, you know, in hindsight, it's like, no, this is, neurons need to talk to each other to make sense of the information that's coming in. And that stress, that perturbation that's coming in is actually meaningful information if you can decode it. So in order for the system to decode it, make sense of it, and then mount an intelligent response that will allow the organism and the system to, to remain alive and to remain healthy and to adapt to it, there needs to be communication, right? That's how complex networks and complex uh, systems work and, and uh process information and adapt. So I think that's how we see those signals that mitochondria release. If you look at it simplistically, you say mitochondrial DNA release, bad, triggers inflammation, bad. You say mitochondria release these molecules. It has multiple effects. We've looked at one thing, inflammation. Yes, <laughs> inflammation can be bad, but inflammation is also important for the adaptation of, of the adaptive processes and so on. So I think the the overly simplistic explanation or interpretation comes from our lack of sufficient knowledge and uh, maybe the, the simplicity or uh, simplicity of our minds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we know that there's this link between 
stress, the brain's perception of stress or the mind's perception of stress and causing these various potentially negative effects in mitochondria. And certainly if the stress is very chronic, almost certainly very negative effects on mitochondrial health. Um, we also know that there is uh, an emerging link through a number of studies with mitochondrial dysfunction and psychological factors like uh, or, or brain related conditions like depression and anxiety uh, and even neurodegenerative diseases going more into to brain conditions. But we, we know that there's this, this link there. Do you think that uh, this, you know, kind of a simple model of this, and, and I'm sure that this is oversimplifying and leaving out of a lot of, a lot of complexity, but do you think it's reasonable to say that uh, stress on this system can cause mitochondrial dysfunction that can contribute very directly to things like anxiety and depression? I think that's very likely. And at this point, we don't have all of the pieces of the puzzle to say uh, for sure that this is how it happens right? and that depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and so on or mitochondrial disorders. Um, we do see these, these psychiatric disorders more frequently in people who come in with a, a genetic defect in the mitochondria, like I mentioned earlier. So that's fairly strong evidence that if something is wrong with the mitochondria, this can cause defects of, you know, uh, perception of reality or, you know, perception of the world and regulation of mood and affect and, and so on. So there's, there's some evidence, but we don't know for sure that the stress causes psychopathology through the mitochondria, but I think it's likely. Uh, and something that we um, identified recently, we wanted to know just how you feel influence your mitochondria and how you feel meaning both negative stuff like stress and um, and sadness and depression but also positive stuff like feeling inspired you know feeling love closeness and trust and you know feeling uh, motivated and uplifted and you know these kind of good things that, that we we feel once in a while so we wanted to know are these things predictive of how well someone's mitochondria work mm -hmm. uh or is it that the how the mitochondria work predict how you feel in the future? And we worked with Elissa Apple uh, at, uh, in, in San Francisco, who had this beautiful study where they, they had the woman uh, fill out questionnaires, you know, diary. So in the morning, it takes about 10 minutes and you, you say how much stress you feel right now, how stressful do you think the day is going to be, uh, and then how much love, closeness, and trust you experience. Uh, and then how much, you know, sadness and rejection and, um, and anger do you feel? And then they would do this also in the evening. So then for a whole week, people did this at home. That was like a little take home <laughs> homework. Uh, and then, so we had measures of how positive and also how negative people felt in the morning, in the evening for seven days in a row. And then the beautiful thing that Alyssa did is that she had people come in on the fourth day they came into the, the research lab and then they gave blood. And from the blood, we isolated white blood cells, which are cells of the immune system that have mitochondria. And then we measured the mitochondrial health. So uh, we developed a little method to, to get at how much energy uh, the mitochondria can, can generate for the white blood cells. And then we looked at whether how people felt on the first day, day one, day two, day three, does that predict how well the mitochondria work on day four? So is it the mood that's influencing the mitochondria, or the mind and the mitochondria, or is it the mitochondria that's influencing how the mind factors or the mood on days five, six, and seven, right? And what we found was that it was particularly how positive people felt on the day just before the blood draw, that where the, the association was the strongest. So how people felt the day before they came, how positive, especially in the evening, was associated with how much energy the mitochondria could generate the next morning. Uh, and to us, that was you know, mind blowing. The effects were pretty strong. And so would that suggest that the data from that study, and now we need to do more studies and replicate this and look at this and you know, more people than in men and women, uh, is that 10 to 15% of mitochondrial energy production capacity in, in the immune system is uh, explained by how you feel the night before. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, in the other direction, was there a correlation at all? 
uh, as far as the, the health of mitochondria pre predicting how a person felt? There was zero association for the, the things that we looked at. Oh, wow. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I was a bit surprised by that. And uh, so the, the strength of the association is, is definitely stronger. The mitochondria uh, um, don't predict how people feel as much as how they feel predict, you know, how the mitochondria work. But again, this is one study uh, in 91 women, and uh, there, there's definitely a lot more work to be done. And I think it's a, there's nothing in biology that, that's linear, and it's very unlikely that it's a purely um, <laughs> unidirectional process. Yeah. Now, speaking to that other direction, do you think it's, it's reasonable to think that there is a relationship uh, between mitochondrial health and specifically the, the, the person's perception of stress or a person's resilience to stress. So for, for example, um, I've taken from some research and it's funny, I have a, an image that I've used and modified that I took from this random animal study. I'm actually wondering if this is one of your studies. I found this study years ago and I kind of repurposed this image from this study and modified in, in a bunch of ways. And I literally, right before this interview, found this exact image, I mean, the original one that I took on your website for your lab. Uh, and it, it's a concept that I've termed the resilience threshold. Um, and it's basically talking about how, uh, in, to the degree that we have bigger, stronger, healthier mitochondria, more of them, our, our cells, literally at the cellular level, we know at, at least at that level, you know, whether this correlates with the mind's perception of stress is another thing, but at least on the cellular level, we know that bigger, stronger, healthier mitochondria and more of them means a much bigger capacity to tolerate the stressors of the modern world and to not experience what, what's called allostatic overload and where you get uh, symptoms and pathology and disease where the, the mitochondria are overwhelmed by the stress, start shutting down energy production, shifting out of that peacetime metabolism into defense mode, throwing off purines, throwing off mitochondrial DNA, uh, causing oxidative stress and oxidative damage and, uh, and, and symptoms like fatigue. So the more that mitochondria you have, the higher your resilience threshold and the less likely you are to experience that issue, at least on the cellular level. Now, first of all, so two questions. One, would you agree with the way I explained that. And then two, do you think that this could also potentially translate into the mind's perception of stress and how resilient a person is? Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I think you portrayed the, the situation very clearly and very well. I definitely agree with that. Um, and yes, that's uh, we're testing that idea at the moment. So what we found a few years ago uh, was that in mice, if you perturb the mitochondria, so you decrease the ability of mitochondria to make energy, or you cause mitochondrial dysfunction, when you expose a mouse with abnormal mitochondria compared to a genetically identical mouse with normal mitochondria, the mouse with the abnormal mitochondria will perceive the same psychological stressor very differently. Mm. And the physiological, the biological response in the body of the mouse in response to that psychological stressor is very different. And even though, you know, under normal conditions, you look at these mice, you can't tell them apart, right? They, one of them has a mitochondrial dysfunction, the other doesn't. But when you stress them, you see all of these, uh, you know, beautiful multi-systemic, um, you know, response signatures that emerges uh, and that's regulated by the mitochondria. So in animals, and you know, there's a lot of research that, you know, starts this way, right, as a proof of concept. You perturb the mitochondria, you can do this mechanistically, and then you can show, if I change one thing in the mitochondria, I change stress perception. Mm -hmm. So now we've moved away from the animal work, and now we're testing this in humans. So we have people come into the lab, and then we profile their mitochondria. So we measure their mitochondrial phenotypes, or we call them the mitotypes. Uh, and then we quantify each person's mitotypes. Each, per each person's mitochondria are pretty different. And there is a big spectrum of how much energy uh, a person's mitochondria can generate, and then what kind of um, of uh, what style of mitochondria they have. Right, the same way that for personality, there's not like a higher or lower personality. There's different types or qualities of, of personalities. Right, 
the big five personality characteristics or things like that. So we're trying to develop at the moment tools to do the same kind of things, you know, personality profiling of mitochondria. Fascinating. Yeah. So and then, I, I want to I tie a few things into this. Um, you said something at the beginning of this podcast talking about exercise that we know that exercise can basically double uh, the amount of mitochondria in a person's in a, in a person's muscle tissues and probably other tissues in the in the body as well. I'll speak to that from a different angle. There's a number of of studies that have looked at mitochondrial capacity over the course of people's lifespan, uh, and you're probably familiar with with some or all of this research, where they basically take muscle biopsies, they look at um, the amount of mitochondria in the cells, and they measure mitochondrial capacity in various ways. Uh, and they've shown in most of these studies, the results are very consistent that between the ages of about 40 to 70, people, most people lose about half of their mitochondrial capacity. And there's probably, there's evidence suggesting that probably from 20 to 40, people lose about half of their mitochondrial capacity. So over the course of 20 to 70, most likely they're losing something like 70, 75% of their mitochondrial capacity in most people. So, um, and, and, I, and I will also say that there's evidence looking at specifically people who are highly active, like people who are athletes, but who are 70, and they've shown that those people don't lose half their mitochondrial capacity. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, that hormesis, the presence of hormesis, seems to be the defining factor, not aging, but the degree of hormesis seems to be the defining factor in how much mitochondrial capacity a person loses. But we know also that you know, circadian rhythm disruption and sleep deprivation can damage mitochondria in various ways. Melatonin plays a critical role in mitochondrial health. Man-made toxins play a critical role. We know there's a gut mitochondria link. We know nutrition plays a big role. Psychological stress plays a big role. So we know all of these different factors tie into this. So uh, I, the way I would conceptualize this is over the course of a person's lifespan, to the degree that they're lacking hormesis, not eating a good diet, not minding their circadian rhythm and sleep habits, um, not exercising, uh, have psychological stress, have exposure to lots of toxins, they are basically, it's a perfect storm of factors that are, they're losing mitochondria rapidly, and the mitochondria they do have are get, becoming more and more damaged and dysfunctional, ultimately leading to a, a lower, a progressive lowering of a person's resilience threshold and capacity to adapt to stressors, where they're much more likely to perceive, be overwhelmed by stress, have a low have a very low threshold for tolerating stress and so on, and much more likely to have those mitochondria actually be overwhelmed such that they get pathology and disease. Mm -hmm. That's my two minute like overarching model of human health. I'm just curious if, if you <laughs> would uh, agree with my general framework there. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? You know, with, within the context of everything you mentioned, most people remain healthy for most of their life. <laughs> So funny. I was just saying that to my wife the other day. I was like, "How it's amazing to me, given how many things we're doing wrong. Most people are doing wrong. It's amazing that we make it past 40. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, it's superb resilience and, you know, a bit ability to adapt. Um, you know, you find people who go through the, the, the harshest and, you know, most horrible uh, things and, and they adapt to this and actually, you know, experience growth in some cases. Um, and the, the organism is just a, such a, a masterpiece of, you know, uh, of adaptation. We have the ability, you know, physically, physiologically, but also psychologically and mentally, you know, people adapt to, um, to amazing things. Uh, again, adaptation requires energy and, you know, to some extent, that's one way when, you know, you see people in a clinic who are very sick or people who, you know, end up you know, with disability that, you know, lasts a long time, that's failure to adapt, right? Uh, so we can see disease, not necessarily as kind of a, an anomaly that, you know, arises spontaneously, but as a, a chronic failure to adapt. Um, and people who have defective mitochondria seem to show that, and, and they're unable to bounce back from little things that other people would, um, including circadian rhythms and <laughs> including maybe you know normal daily stressors and uh and other things so uh, yeah i think it's it's phenomenal to to see how how resilient and and how you know well the organism can adapt to things and um you know ultimately i hope that 
our research is going to help to build a, uh, you know, a bioenergetic view of, of health. And we know so little about health. We know a lot about disease. Um, mm. We don't know very much about what keeps us healthy and <laughs> yeah. what's the, um, and what, I, are, what I, are the things? That's yeah. such a good way of phrasing it. I would agree we need to be spending, I would say probably directing like 60 or 70% of funds towards studying health rather than studying how to fix disease. I think we get a lot further uh, oh, yeah. in fixing the healthcare model and, and actually helping people be healthy if we yep. did yeah, it's kind of a, we study disease and then that leads to wanting to fix disease and then that leads to developing, you know, very targeted, specialized uh, molecules, drugs, um, and then that leads to, you know, the way that we practice medicine, uh, which is palliative and once disease is there, because we don't know what to do when there's no disease. So we need to wait for a disease to happen yeah. and then... <laughs> then, then we come up with with chemicals that you know suppress some of these symptoms, and it's never addressing. It's never helping people to be healthy. It's 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 remarkable. And to your point, you know, some of the the key overarching themes that you've been talking about, if, as far as your work, the, all of these different systems of the body are intertwined. So, to a large extent, I would argue that the whole fundamental paradigm of seeking out some specific you know, molecule that's, or, or, or biochemical process that's gone awry and then developing a drug intervention to target this specific biochemical process and correct it is, is just myopic and, and so reductionistic and missing the big picture of how all these systems are intertwined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is we don't know, we, we, don't, we don't see the bigger picture <laughs> yet, <laughs> yet. Um, and if we did, I think we could probably uh, and if we did, and if we had a less kind of mechanical view of, of how the system works, then we might be able to come up with uh, a lot more, um, you know, intelligent or holistic or uh, personalized ways to, to help people, you know, uh, develop and, and harness their own resilience and ability to, to heal and, and recover. Yeah. Uh, and then that, I think that's the real way forward for, for healthcare. Yeah, right on. I agree with you. I know you have to run. So I have one final question to you, which is given everything you know about mitochondria, given everything you know about mitochondrial psychobiology and the research that you've done, what is one thing, one tip from the research you know, that, that, that you've done on a practical level, the one thing that you want to leave people with as something they can take from this field of mitochondrial psychobiology to apply in their lives to improve their health, improve their energy levels, improve their mitochondrial health? Um, that is a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I, I tend to think, and I think there's still more work to be done to, to be sure if that's the case, but you know, the things that you feel that make you, the, the things that you do that make you feel energetic uh, the, the people that you hang out with that make you feel uplifted and inspired. And um, so that subjective feeling of being energetic uh, is probably so uh, not so divorced from actually, you know, the, <laughs> the actual energetic function of, of your mitochondria. Mm. Uh, so, you know, engaging in behaviors um, and in actions that actually uh, stimulate that in you, you know, whatever that is. And I think that's different for, for different people, um, is I think likely to have good health effects and, and good effects, you know, on, on people's lives. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, Dr. Picard, this has been so much fun. Uh, this has been amazing. I, this is honestly one of my most favorite interviews I've ever done. I, I've really, really enjoyed talking to you. I thank you so much for the work that you've done. The research has, that you've done has had a profound influence on me and my, my thinking and the work that I do. And uh, I would love to have you on again after you get the results back of the, the next study or two that you're doing. Uh, this has been just fascinating. And, and I hope to have you on again, maybe a couple more times over the next. Week. <laughs> so, that sounds great. Yes. And I, I, I'd be delighted. I had a, a lot of fun. Thank you for that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, have a wonderful night. I know you got to get, get home to dinner with your wife and your family. So thank you again for staying a little uh, extra with me and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.
Also, one more thing before you go, I just want to mention for those of you who were fascinated with this topic and this podcast, if you want to follow Dr. Picard's work further, you can check out his website uh, at picardlab.org, and you can follow him at Twitter at mitosiglab. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.